Shio, Shio Nagara, Ayano Gatsudi Delegiski, Colona Yamoyaskeya, Galeeli Gatsi Luki Ahane. Hello, my name is Bo Taylor. I'm a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I'm, uh, I live in the Big Cove community. I'm happy to be here. Um, you know, they wanted me to talk a little bit about how the EBCI was, was uh, kind of working our revitalization efforts in, in culture and language. But first, I, I really need to tell you a little bit about how I got to where I am. You know, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a product of the 70s. I was born in 1969. And I've seen a lot of changes that happened during my time. Uh, I was a, it was a time when there were speakers everywhere. There was, uh, everywhere you went, there were speakers, but we didn't pay attention. We didn't care. We didn't exactly, we just didn't really take the time that we needed. And so what happened, you know, I, I grew up and I, uh, you know, I, I, I love sports and football and wrestling and that was my thing. So I didn't pay attention. And for the most part, I was actually kind of, uh, ashamed to be an Indian, uh, ashamed to be Cherokee. Reason being is, you know, it's like at that time they didn't like us because we were poor and they said we didn't have, you know, we got all these benefits. Now they don't like us because we have all this money and we get all these benefits. So this is where it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, you know, the one thing that happened to me was uh, I had a wake up call. You know, I was, uh, I lived my life and went to school and, but when I got to college, I didn't have anything. I didn't have sports. I was, I didn't have anything to rely on, but this one guy, I was going to college and, uh, this guy walked up to me and he goes, Hey Max, how are you doing? And he was really trying to get at me. You know, he, he thought I was Mexican and he said hey, Max and, but I looked at him and I, I said, I ain't no dang Mexican. I'm an Indian. I didn't say dang. I used another word and I was, I'm ashamed that I was even that mad, but I was ready to fight this guy. But what happened was it was a, it, if I saw that guy today, I would, I would uh, walk up to him and I would say, thank you. Even though you were being a jerk, I would say, thank you. I appreciate that you gave me the impetus to become who I needed to be. But see, when I woke up, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it meant to be a Cherokee. I grew up in a time when uh, uh, in Cherokee, North Carolina, there were a lot of Indian things, but it was all pan Indian. It was fake Indian. It was, it was teepees and wigwams and craft shops, you know, the proverbial tourist trap. And so, you know, that's how we brought tourists in. And that's how we, you know, uh, made a lot of our money. And so, that's what I knew. And what I did is I, I started reaching out to any Indian things. I started reaching out to powwows. And when I was a little, little guy, my mom wanted me to, to Indian dance. And she got me a little outfit and I danced for maybe six months, but I was done. But I reached back to that. And, and I, 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 I traveled all over the country, you know, doing uh, powwow stuff. But what happened was uh, what I realized was, I wasn't being me. I wasn't being a Cherokee. I wasn't being what I was supposed to do. And so that kind of put me on a, on a journey to learn who, who I, I, who I am and who I was. And I'm very fortunate that I had some amazing people put in my path. You know, uh, I always want to acknowledge people like, uh, Walker Calhoun, Robert Bushyhead, Shirley Oswald, Jerry Wolf, these people, they took time to teach me. Um, my grandfather, who, who was a speaker and knew songs and dances, he taught me when I was a little, a little guy and sung to me. And uh, he died real early and because of diabetes and, and cancer. So I didn't have that. But these, these people filled in for me. They took the time to fill in and and to, to give me knowledge and to teach me and to share with, share with me. So it's been a very, um, it's been a long journey. And, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be where I'm at, you know, but 
what happened was I found the the powwow stuff, but what I realized wasn't me. And then so what happened? There was a uh, that's some of our some of the powwow guys, Daniel Tramper, Will Tushka, Hoss Tramper. These guys were all powwow guys, and we uh, asked us to. There was a group coming, and they wanted to do a turkey dance. And so what happened was we we dressed up and we did this welcoming dance and what we did we we reached back into the ar- into the archives and we looked at some of the it was an old uh, manuscript an old book written about uh, memoirs of Henry Timberlake and what they did is they we we I knew how to sing the song because it was there was an old wax cylinder that had the the war dance that was on it and but they documented how the, the dance was to be done, and so uh, we took the song and we, and we we all dressed up and painted. As, you know, we were we were almost comical because we didn't really know what we were doing. We were kind of just really learning a little about about who we were, and when we were dressing in the 1760s clothing, and uh, but what that did it, it was a it was a very important spark into. Uh, how things have changed. If you go to uh, Cherokee now, you know, before that, when I was growing up, if you, if they were dancing in uh, uh, Cherokee dances, they were wearing blue jeans and maybe a ribbon shirt, um, maybe a pair of moccasins. More likely, it was just tennis shoes. And so what they were doing is they were, some of them were keeping some of these dances alive. But what we did is we started adopting the clothing. We started dressing in that period of clothes. Today, I'm kind of dressed in that period, 1760s. Uh, this is uh, kind of what you would have been if you're going out and out along the town or whatever. The, you know, the 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 scarf around my head is, uh, is the precursor to the turbans that they were wearing. You know, but we were dressing. We started dressing, and we got even better at it. We started going into the archives and digging out. Uh, different things and different accounts and we were investigating the jewelry of the day i'm wearing silver and that's i tell everybody that's the bling bling of the of the uh 18th century and so that's what we were doing we, we started wearing this stuff and really dressing it out and we uh and we got started getting noticed you know a lot of people were noticing what we're doing and a lot of people were making fun of us at first because they would say, you know, I don't remember us dressing like that. You know, we would have some of our old elders saying, you know, I don't remember dressing like that, but that was, we were actually moving back 150, 200 years. And, you know, of course they wouldn't have seen that. But now we were dressing like this and we were uh, getting people starting to build some momentum about this. They were seeing what we were doing. They were, they started liking it. And, and they invited us to go and dance and do a, all these presentations. And what happened, we, we went to this uh, Southeastern, Southeastern Tribes. And I remember that the Creeks showed up. And any, any of you Creeks, please don't get offended. But the Creeks were all there, but they were, you know, they were doing their, their stomp dances. And what happened, they, they showed up and we were all dressed out. We were painted all in red. We were decked out all in red. We were. We, we came and we did our dances and we would yell, we were, you know, we'd come and, you know, we would challenge, woo, woo, woo. We started challenging. And I remember that the Creeks looked at us. I remember some, some of those men, they just looked at us. But they all came up and they wanted to talk to us and they all wanted to know what we were doing, what we were about. The thing was, they knew that they looked like us. They knew that they were kind of supposed to be dressing like us. And so what this has done is this created a lot of momentum uh, in our community. If you come to uh, our uh, our pageants, pageants, the Miss Cherokee, the Little Miss Cherokee, they're all dressing in the 1760s uh, time period. And before they were wearing the the tear dress, and in the '60s they were wearing these buckskin dresses that were kind of more of a, a pan Indian thing. But what has happened is we have, I, I kind of feel like we have uh, sparked a a 
cultural uh, revitalization, kind of a renaissance, where Cherokees are starting to pick up things. You know, and I was I was fortunate enough. I was working at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, and I was uh, I was the director, and we we did a lot of promotion promotional things on revitalization projects. We did language, we did uh, um, um, pottery, feather capes, and one thing that I do know is that I got to visit the Cherokee Nation's new museum uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And when I was in there and I was, I'm really amazed at uh, how well they've done. But what I did see was they were, they were showing representations of the old way. They were showing the, the, the feather cloaks and, you know, some of the copper and, and the silver and, and the pucker toe moccasins and, I kind of feel like we we helped that. We actually, I remember some of the Jane Ostee and Lisa Rutherford, Rutherford came out and learned how to do some of these things and they took it back. We actually went out and danced uh, and, 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 and did presentations. So what has happened is, you know, our community has kind of adopted this. They have adopted the this time period. And uh, I think it's been, it's been very influential and, and been a good positive thing for us because in a lot of uh, native communities, they're dying. Their cultures are dying. They're, they're, you know, they're, you know, we've got diabetes. We've got a definite drug problem. We have the same problem, but the thing about it is I kind of feel like our, our people have kind of grabbed onto this and it's, I feel like it's gave them some strength. And now, you know, I went to a football game last night, uh, 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 boys when they're getting ready to come out they're doing a challenge call just like a like the uh like they were playing uh uh indian ball they're, they go woo, woo, and the fans in the stand are yelling so i think it's been really good and uh what i'd like to do is kind of open it up to if anybody has any questions as we're going on if if uh uh vince or marcus uh, want to uh pass along any questions about about what's happening and how things have happened in, in Cherokee. I, I would love to, to share that with you. You know, um, you know, I, I do want to start out by just, just letting you guys know that uh, sometimes I do get in trouble. Uh, I tend to talk too much. Sometimes I, uh, I, uh, I say things and, but please don't get offended. If anybody's out there that gets offended, please don't be offended. But what has happened is, you know, there's this story that I, that I, I tell people it's, uh, you know, uh, it's like culture is like love. There's this thing that they call it. It's like, love is like sand in your hand. You can take, you can take the sand and grab it and hold it. And you can take it and you can pass it around the people and share it. But the moment that you try to control it, the moment that you try to covet it, what happens is it slips through your hands. This is what's important. I think it's important that as, as Cherokee people, if our culture is to, to keep going, then we have to share that. We have to teach it. We have to uh, not live in fear that people are going to steal it. The biggest fear that we could ever have is that we we had it and we let it die, and so that that's that's my challenge is to actually, um, you know, I'm challenging people to to learn their culture, to learn the language, to to learn as much as they can, and 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 to and to to promote Cherokee, to promote being a Gadua, the old way. So, you know, I'm dressed in this. I'm dressed in 1760s attire right now but you know tomorrow I, I could be wearing a three-piece suit you know i could be eating bean bread one night and eating escargot the next it's i have to live in balance and this is the thing is like if we don't have our culture then we don't live in balance and so um that is my challenge so uh are there any questions we do have one question that came up. It says, how do you share stomp dances and ceremonial ways to young people? Well, this is, uh, this is where, this is, uh, and uh, please, I do not try to offend anybody. 
you know, I, uh, I usually tell, tell stories. This is how I do things. And it's, it's, it's really weird that I'm sitting here and we're talking and this is, this is not how things are supposed to be done. We should be together and talking and, and sharing. And this is, this is a great thing, but it's an awesome question. There was this, uh, my mentor, the man that I love deeply, who, who was like a, uh, a grandfather, a best friend. He was the best. He was my best man at my wedding. And he was many years older than me. He was 60 plus years older than me. But anyway, he was, uh, he went to Oklahoma one time and he said, you know, uh, I've been hearing about this stomp dance and I don't know what it is. I want to see it. And, and they said, well, we'll take you out there. So they took him to the Redbird stomp grounds where the, you know, where Redbird brought it and, and, and kept it and, and, what happened was he got there and he goes, oh, I know what this is. This is mixed dance. We used to do this when I, when I was a boy. He knew the songs. He knew songs that they didn't know. He knew how to, you know, uh, but what the difference was, stomp dance, it's all in an intention. And this is where, you know, you know, this is where people say, well, I don't know if we should share stomp dances. Well, stomp dance, what makes it, from, from my opinion, what makes it a, a, a religious event is when you have the intention. When they build the fire, it has the intention. They're going to come and pray. They're going to come and dance. They're going to do this. There's medicine that's put in that fire. And they come and they, and they do have medicine they sing and they pray and the, the the intention is there for that but what i do know is there's all there are many accounts of people coming into cherokee country and what they will find is you know when they come in what they'll do is do a dance and they will dance all night long it's the same dances they were doing at the stomp dances but the dances that they were doing is the mixed dance it's a social dance and if if you if you see what Walker was doing, the mixed dance, and what Redbird Smith was doing, they are the same dances, but the intention was different. And now, what they said, they would do these dances in in the in the winter time, and they would move. They'd have a house, and they would move all the furniture out, and they would do all these dances, and they would court, and they would, you know, you know, they were they would socialize, and this is where where the, the Eastern band and the Western band are tend to be a little bit different. You know, the, I know that a lot of times the Western band doesn't like to share any of the dances because they're considered to be got that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's all ceremonial. Whereas Cherokees, we, we do all these animal dances and, you know, they have them at our, uh, at our, uh, at our fair and, you know, and, and, you know, even back in the day, they were wearing those, turtle shackles on their feet when they were dancing and I asked Walker I said you know when you were growing up and they did these dances did they wear the shackles and he said yes every dance needs it because there's a balance there's a role between men, women and men it's a it's a definite balance that when we dance those those shackles and when the men sing there is a blend that comes together that is beautiful and this is what the creator wants the fear is the thing that has kind of kept us and divided us. You know, uh, when Redbird Smith went and he took those old ways and he, he, he hid them, it was out of necessity. He did that to, to, uh, to take care and, and to make sure that it didn't die and that it would be promoted and that it would be saved. And, and, this is the thing that we as Cherokees need to remember that we don't, we shouldn't live in fear. When Cher one of the things they say is, uh, uh, this is some of the fallacies that I hear about Cherokees. It says, oh, Cherokees won't look you in the eye and Cherokees are meek and they're, they don't speak loud. They're quiet. That's bull crap. As Cherokees, we didn't become the dominant force in the Southeast by being meek. 
we were progressive and we were we were bold and we you know we we were Cherokee and that was an awesome thing we were doing and and when you speak the Cherokees they would say um there's accounts they would say these Cherokees they talk and I don't understand the word they're saying but I was moved to tears by the way that they spoke and this is what this is something that we need to remember as Cherokees we need to stop being afraid of being Cherokee. Our dances, they belong to us. We own them. They're ours. We should, we should, our children need to have those. They shouldn't have to uh, live in fear of, of promoting that. And so that's the thing. I'm, this is where I, the, I tend to have a different philosophy is that if we're going to, if we're going to teach it, We've got to make sure that they're learning, learning the, the right way and, and give them the opportunity to learn and, and give them the opportunity to pick it up. And so they're not afraid. A lot of people that are Cherokee are afraid of stomp dance because they think it's it's a devil worship and it's dark and it's all this other stuff. But that's not true. There is a beautiful, there is a beautiful balance in, in the stomp. There is a beautiful balance in this, the songs. There's a beautiful balance and ceremony and we've got to embrace that I don't, i'm not advocating what we teach that i think it does belong to cherokees i do believe that it, it should be taught only to cherokees but our dances are something that we shouldn't be afraid to do and share and you know our and that's just a different philosophy so i don't know if i really answered your 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 the the question one thing i do know is uh i i have a little i have a little cd it's uh it's called uh rebuilding the fire and it's got a lot of our songs on it and walker did songs uh as well but i took a lot of the old uh uh wax cylinders and i learned some of the songs i learned a lot of the songs i learned all the songs actually but what i did i learned all these songs and i put some of them on this on the on this uh on the CD and then I sold it and I, I didn't do it to, for me to make money. Uh, I, what I did is people have picked it up and learned it. People know these songs now. People, it's not just a few people. When, when I was learning the songs, there were five people that knew how to sing the songs. That really knew how to sing the songs. There were five. Now you can go to Cherokee. There's a lot of the guys that know how to sing the songs. And it's because they had an avenue to learn. It's better to learn at the feet of these old ones. It's better to learn that way, but we don't have that right now. And so uh, what I did is try to give them every opportunity to learn and to dance. And so anyway. All right, Bo, we have another question. Are Cherokee Nation citizens allowed to participate in Eastern Band events uh, when they visit the homelands? And how would one go about contacting people to do that? Well, you know, what I would do is, first of all, we are, we have a different fire, but we are the same people. We belong to each other. We, we are family. We, you know, we need to recognize this. And there's a, you know, the old way that clan, uh, that clan a connection ran so deep, it, it ran throughout, it permeated our, our entire culture. We've kind of lost sight of that, that we are clannish in, in how we do things and how we interact. As, as Cherokees, I can only speak for me, but a lot of the Cherokees back in uh, the Eastern Band, we love when people come to visit. We love that you come and that you kind of consider that to be the homeland. And it's called it Zalagi Uweti, the old Cherokee, you know, the old way. The, you know, we we love that. We we recognize you guys as family, as 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 some of our own. You know, the some uh, some of the best times I've had is when I get to commune and learn from from uh, from you guys. You know, there was a. There was a play done by this. Uh, it was, it was, we had the outdoor drama, and what happened? They changed it. There was like two years that it got changed, and they brought this uh, guy.
guy named Hane Gigama in. And he was, and he he did it a little bit different. And the Cherokees got it. We got it, but the the non-natives, they didn't get it. They wanted the sadness, they wanted the the death and the you know, the the, the tragic story, the Holocaust. But Hane changed he, he he didn't change the story but he let people know we're still here but there is one part in the in the in the show when they were depicting the removal and what happened was they were they split the clans they had these clan masks and they had the seven clans and three went to the east or stayed in the east and four went west but it really was a good representation of what happened our clan system got kind of split and it got, you know, uh, you go uh, into Oklahoma, they're going to be more clans represented and less in, in the East. But why, why I kind of bring this up is that our clans need to come together. We need to come back to each other, to, to, to love one another. His dog gave you he to love each other and, and to bring each other back together and bring the, you know, our clan system and our, our, so, if you wanted to come and visit people in Cherokee, uh, you know, I, I would reach out to the museum or, or any of the organizations that are, you know, the visitor center, they, what they'll do is they'll tend to send you, uh, send people out, you know, but here's the thing. People shouldn't come, come to Cherokee looking for the medicine. Man. They don't, they shouldn't come looking for, you know, uh, spiritual guidance. What they should come to do is come to learn, come to learn, about who we are, you know, and, and that's the thing. And, 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 you know, when I go to Oklahoma, you guys have some real treasures out there that we have uh, get a chance to learn from. And so that's the thing. It's, it's, it's time that we do share and, and make that more of a, uh, not a regular, uh, 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 it should be a regular occurrence, one that's, uh, that doesn't happen, you know, that often. We have tried council every once in a while. We should, you know, what I would hope is that we could actually have uh, exchange students. You know, we might send some of our Cherokee speakers. They might not, you know, we tend to focus on high school age or something. Maybe we should send some of our Cherokee uh, uh, language students that are learning and send them out there and, and let them hang with you guys and vice versa and, and try to, learn how we do things and, and, and the language and how it's, how it's evolved. I think that would be a good thing. And, and just coming together is, is a beautiful thing and hopefully we can do more of it. All right. I have another question here. It's, it's asking what is the significance of the ceremonial fire? Well, now that's a big question. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share something with you, and it's, it's something that you know. You know, there was this time when I was I was really into fitness, and I was I was uh, it was probably in the spring of the year, and it was kind of ra rainy and damp. But I went to the unto these hills. There's this spot where they had this place where this eternal flame was lit, and what happened back in the uh, '80s. They actually went to the stomp grounds at Redbird and kindled this fire and they ran it back. Uh, one of my good friends is Bullet Standing Deer and uh, I think Gil Jackson was on that and, and some, some people from the uh, Western Band. But what they did is they ran this fire back. They ran it back and they carried these torches and they lit it up and they had ceremony and all this stuff. And But there was this little glass case and it had the fire in there. I went to go visit. I went to go to commune. But when I got there, it was out. Oh, I lost my mind. I was, I was beside myself. I didn't know what to do. And so I, I went behind the thing and I saw a little copper tube leading to a big gas propane tank and it said heritage propane. And I didn't know what to do. I was sick. But then I got to spend this time, some time with another gentleman from uh, from from out west, and I won't say his name, but this is his story. And he said, "You know, Bo said 
the Gaduas, what they would do is they would they would stand on the riverbanks and they would look up to the east in the mornings and they would greet. That's I'm sorry about that. It's a blower. They would greet the morning and they would sing songs and they would lift the sun up into the sky. And I want you to think about that. That is a beautiful thing that they that the Cherokees would go and welcome the sun and they would lift it up with their hands and sing and honor it. And what he said is that they said that the sun was the embodiment of God. It wasn't God. It was a, 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 a way of us saying what God was. It, it, it brought light to the world. It made the world a better place when the sun was shining. It gave us warmth. It was it was a beautiful thing. The sun was awesome. And so we acknowledged it. And said, so when and he goes, when they go around those uh, the, the stomp grounds, we they build that fire. That fire is what well, the old ones believe that's the embodiment of the of the sun on earth. They would dance around it and sing songs and they would offer prayers. He said they that was the mediator. And then he said, and he looked at me, he said, you know. Inside of you, there's a fire. It's the fire that makes you burn at 98.6 degrees that belongs to all of us. They're all related, he said, that the, the sun that burns up in the sky and the one that burns on that mound and the one that burns in our soul, they're all related. They belong to each other. That's the eternal flame. That is the one that is the, the flame that we cannot let die. And if there's any Christians out there, if you take what that old man was talking about, there was a fire that burns up in the sky and there's one that burns on the ground that is the mediator. And there's a one that burns in our soul, but they're all connected three in one. That's the Trinity. You know, God, this is the thing what people need to realize is, is that God has always been with Cherokees. God has always been with us. And there is a prophecy that I tell people all the time, anybody that will listen. He said, uh, the prophecy went like, goes like this. He said, uh, the Cherokees would get to this place where they would lose so much. They would start, they would lose their land. They would start losing their identity. They would start losing their language. But what would happen is they would get it back. And what would happen is that all the other tribes would look to the Cherokees for their identity. And I, and I thought about that for a long time and I saw what was happening with the revitalization and all this stuff. And what happens is not everybody's going to speak Cherokee. Not all these Indian tribes are going to, are going to be Cherokee speakers, but what's going to happen. They're going to see how we did it. They're going to see how we brought it back. I am, I am so uh, filled with hope. I got to visit with you guys and with, with Howard and with Ryan and, and the new language program that the, the chief is promoting and, and the things that are happening. I see great movement. I see awesome things happening. I've, I have heard that the, the Cherokees, nobody's going to ever learn how to speak Cherokee. It's too tough. It's a tough language. But I met somebody who didn't know hardly any Cherokee but now he speaks, and a lot of these old ones, they are impressed. So I know it can happen. There's hope for me. I still think that I'm going to strive to become a speaker. But the thing about the fire, why I'm bringing this up is like, one part of the thing was if, if when Cherokees quit being Cherokee, when Cherokees stop and they they quit speaking, they quit singing the songs, and they quit being what the creator wanted us to be. That is when the world would end. So I have a responsibility. I have a deep responsibility. Anybody that says that they're Cherokee, and I don't know this sounds very preachy, and, and I'm going to say it anyway. Anybody that ever says that they're a Cherokee, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to give it back. You have a responsibility to teach it. You have a responsibility to learn it. That is your responsibility. You being a Cherokee 
does not give you the uh, the responsibility of getting uh, money for college. That is a perk. It isn't about free health care. That is a perk. What is being a real Cherokee is being a real Cherokee. So, and I know that might sound, you know, uh, preachy or whatever, but, you know, one thing that we've got to realize is that we must accept responsibility for who we are and not apologize for it and not be ashamed to be who we are. And then, uh, anyway, uh, did everybody leave? Did it <laughs> hang up on me now? No, we still got, uh, actually, no, we, we're, we're, we're still here. So here's my question. Uh, you know, since we, you know, since we are a Cherokee, you know, there's always going to be similarities. I like to uh, revolve around the different foods that I have learned, like, you know, uh, there's kanuchi uh, in the springtime. Uh, we always uh, pick the chana wishy around here. Those, you know, wild onions around here. That's what we like to do. That's what we like to eat. And that's what I've been taught as far as tradition. You know, you go out a certain time, you pick your hickory nuts, you make your kanuchi. You go out a certain time, you get your wild onions. What are some of the foods? Um, just briefly touch on some of them that, that you all do, that you all gather. Well, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, the only thing that we don't have is the wild onions. So uh, our, our wild onions is wasti and that's the, the ramps and it's the, uh, I, I just think it's wild onions on steroids. It's a little, I think it's more tastier and a little bit more sh stronger and it makes you smell worse, but it tastes really good. But our food, there was this, there was an old man that, when he was, he was telling people, uh, I had done a presentation, but he was telling something that was just a, an ancillary thing that he was adding. He goes, you know, Cherokee's always, you always knew what time of the year it was by what you were eating. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you know, you know, you knew the summer was coming, the blackberries were coming in and, you know, you knew when in the springtime, the, you know, we were eating ramps and that was the time it, it, people were gathering and they were doing all these things. And that's the thing. We kind of have lost that. We've kind of lost the, uh, the relationship. And that's the thing, you know, I think the one thing that we all got to kind of remember is that being a Cherokee is having a relationship with the world with water, with the creator, with all things. I know that sounds like being wooey wooey and all this other stuff, but we've kind of lost that with the, our only hunting and gathering we do is, is at the, at the food store. And this is where we've kind of need to kind of get back. And, and, you know, this thing with COVID and all this other things, I wish people would take this time instead of, you know, getting all politically, immersed in all the, the ramifications of COVID is there is a lesson to be learned here. There is a, that we as Cherokees need to scale back and remember what's important. When during this time of COVID, what I've known, what I come to know is that my family is the most important. It's the people I spend time with. It's my relationship with them that is most important. I did grow a garden. I spent time in there and got my hands dirty and, and, uh, and I sweated and it was a, it was a relationship, you know, and, you know, uh, and I remember, um, uh, when I would go and talk to people, people would share with me. And this is the thing, it's kind of give and take. And this is what's kind of tough is that there's not as much give and take as that we would normally have. But what he would say is, uh, one of the guys come and says, you know, uh, you know, Bo, he said, uh, you know, my, my grandma was always the one that tended the garden. My, my grandpa never did, but she, she was, all, she was the one, but she would go out there and she would talk to the plants and she would, uh, she would commune with those plants. I never knew. I never knew. But if you go back into the old way, women were the, 
the ones that were the real planters they were the ones that men were the muscle we did we did we, we cleared fields and we did all this stuff we hunted and we gathered but the women's were the ones that knew how to nurture and how to to commune and to create the things that we had with the plants and so you know i know i'm running all over the place on this and i'm bringing all this stuff but why why i've i, I keep talking about this is is the relationship the relationship with things and what we've lost that and 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 i appreciate the question about the foods because here's the thing one thing that as turkeys that we love to do is to eat we love to and it's not just about chowing down it's a, it's a matter of that is a time when we come together we share with one another the the potlucks the you know to go out and gather food and to bring it in and share with people and watch them smile and have a good time. You don't get that through the drive through You don't get that with, you know, at the, at the grand buffet, you get it when you come and you, and you sit with your friends and your family and you pray and you, and you share. And this is what I always know. You come into a turkey home, you ask them if they need to eat, you fit, you offer them some water. You offer some something to drink, something to eat. That is being a good Cherokee. And when you come and you eat, we pray and we eat. And what happens is the old ones eat first. The old ones eat first. You know, in this day and age, what we do is send the little ones and so they'll be quiet. You know, if you go to uh, some of the stop dance gatherings, some of the, the kids are in the back, but they saw the relationship that the elders deserved what they had. And now I was sitting back there, well, I hope there's some chicken left. It wasn't like they were mad. It's just like they, they just knew their role, their place. And this is where we, we need to remember that. We need to kind of, anybody that's uh, hoping to take these seminars and learn to be, uh, you know, learn what it means to be a turkey, it, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, this revitalization efforts that are happening are, are you know, you know, I, I, I hope that it continues and grows, but it might not, I might not be alive to see the, when it's really going to be what it needs to be. But I hope I'm, while I'm here, that I've did my part to do as much as I can to, to help it to move forward. And so that somewhere down the line i don't know how many generations it is but they'll look back at us fondly and said you know they had a tough time we didn't have a tough time we had mcdonald's our old ones they they walked the trail but if you go further back we dealt with smallpox we dealt with with famine we've dealt here's the thing that we should remember as cherokees we get up as Cherokees, we we get through, we make it happen. No matter what happens, we we continue. That's the philosophy, the mindset that we should have, and to love one another and and carry everybody up, uh, and not live in fear. Sorry, I know was, you asked me about food, and I went everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. But yeah, I I do understand that that community aspect of it. Um, I've, I've been learning how to cook hog meat for about the past 20 years and you just can't beat, you know, when everybody's just together and, you know, the laughing, the stories that are going on, um, the families that come together, the, the information that's exchanged, you can't beat that. And that is, that's, that's one, one of the reasons why I like doing it. Now there's a lot of hard work that people may not see on my end, but as, as long as I'm able to do that because um, I love seeing it so much that that community aspect, once everybody is eating and being quiet, you know, you can really tell that they're really liking it. You know, it's always it's just quiet. Good. Yeah, it's just, it's just it. quiet. That's music to my ears because everybody there is enjoying each other's company. And, you know, we're, we're just there. It's, it's like, it's, it's family, it's family, you know? So, yeah, I do, I do really do enjoy that. There is another question here. Do you have any suggested literature regarding Cherokee life 
ways? Oh yeah. Well, I probably I probably do. There's uh well here, here's the thing. There's uh James Mooney. That's you know, for the Eastern band, uh, uh, we use that a lot. There's a lot of stories in there and you know, there was actually, it's like three parts. One part is actually uh, history. One part's about uh, stories and one part's about medicine. Well, the part about medicine is, is kind of very general. There's just, you know, it doesn't go into the depths of, of, uh, of, 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 of medicine that we had. Now as Cherokees, we were the we were the pharmacists, you know, where we live in uh, the Eastern Band, the great national uh, park there uh, uh, is the most diverse place in North America, in all of North America for plants and animals. And the Cherokees were there. The Cherokees were the, the pharmacists, the botanists. We, we knew it, we knew we had great medicine. We still got great medicine, but it's fractured. It's out in places medicine is a different thing and and why i keep bringing this up i shouldn't go in there we were talking about literature but they did talk about this and 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 uh so it, it doesn't have all this stuff that you're gonna that should be passed down through families and and you should have the right and 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 really know the responsibility of having medicine I think there's a way to get medicine back, but that's, that is for another thing. That's not for me to say, but for people to go out and learn about, uh, uh Cherokee culture, I, I have used several dissertations. There's this, uh, William Harlan Gilbert. There's a dissertation that he wrote about the Eastern band of Cherokees. And he came and, you know, he sat with Cherokees when there were still Cherokees that were that's all they spoke. That's all they did. That's what Mooney did. You know, uh, if an ethnobotanist come to Cherokee today, they would, you know, they'd be eating at McDonald's most of their time. They would, they wouldn't be eating at the home all the time. They, you know, it's, it's just a different time. But if you go back and look at the dissertations and the, uh, some of the ethnobotanist stuff that's not out there, it's, it's kind of a, a deeper dive. You go further back, there's the, uh, you know, uh, there's a pain manuscript and you have to filter through. There's some things that are, are very pertinent, but there are some things that are kind of clouded with the, uh, there was a, a def, definite uh, Christianity biased on some of the informants. And so they got kind of blended. But if you read through it, you'll, you can kind of see through what's happening. Um, I would say, you know, I, right at the top of my at the top of my head, I, I wouldn't be able to say, yeah, get this, whatever. But maybe someday we can uh, do a reading list or have a, you know, uh, something that where people can uh, reach out and, and learn. One thing that I'm working on, and this is what I know, is there are turkeys out there that are hungry. They're not hungry just for food, but they're hungry to find themselves. They are hungry to be a part, you know, and it's, 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 uh, you know, it's kind of a sad place because sometimes as Cherokees, we have gotten a little, we, the fear has stopped us from being what we are. I keep alluding to that. We find some Cherokees that, that they might be full blood and dark skinned and got the features of Cherokee, but they don't know what it is to be Cherokee. They don't, they don't care. They just, they just, I don't know. I'm sounding preachy, but then you find some Cherokees that are light skinned and that are hungry and, and they're trying to give back. But people that fear them, they will be mean to them. They will say hurtful things to them. And it, that's the stuff that that kills me is that it's the brown on brown crime that we have, that we, 
I know I'm going to piss somebody off when I say this, and I'm sorry for using. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm going to say it, and people will probably be hating on me. I probably by everybody leave the thing. But there are no full blooded Cherokees. What? What did he just say? There are no full blooded Cherokees. Well, in our blood, our blood has Uchi blood in it. Our blood has Creek blood in it. Our blood has uh, Iroquois blood, Catawba blood. What has always won out is the Cherokee mindset. That's what we got to remember. We've got to learn that Cherokees didn't used to live in fear. Cherokees did what they did. They would speak and they would talk and they would pray and they would be who they were and they didn't ask permission and then they didn't that you know they did it that's where we need to be and the Cherokees didn't live in fear of 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 what the white man's going to take what Cherokees need to fear is that what us as Cherokees what we're going to take with us if we come with this mindset to know that you know there are going to be white people that are going to help us. There are going to be black people. There are going to be, but we've got to take care of our people. We've got to take care, make sure that you know, you know. Uh, I would love that we were all dark skinned and full blooded and live like we were, but that's not going to happen. As a Cherokee, you look at and see things for what it is, and if you use your mind. You use your heart and the prayers that we should be doing to say, what do we need to do to make our culture better? It's it's not always going to be about having a uh, uh, a symposium. What it's going to be is getting down to those grassroots of getting to know our people and to love our people and to pick people back up and to share with them and to teach them and to and to once you teach them to let them know they have an expectation to give back if we lose that if we lose our ability to you know where we're always living in fear and all this other stuff the writing is on the wall you know i've you know some of the some of the better speakers out there are the ones that have very little Indian in them or no Indian. My challenge is anybody that says they're Cherokee and you're all this full blooded and all this, no, I'm, I'm dark and whatever. Learn, teach, be what you need to be. Uh, I know. I've my life has been really good and it's because people took time to teach me they took time to love me and dang I hate that I'm even like this but People like Walker Calhoun. So, if I can just leave anybody with anything, I would say, when you give your heart, good things happen. And uh, anyway, so I apologize for sitting here breaking down, but ah, I can't even believe it. <laughs> I don't have people's out there. Dang, it's going to be all over the place, but whatever. Uh, I tell you what, man, nobody has left. We still got the, we still got the number. That there's still had. time. I can still make somebody mad. <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what, Bo, we got five minutes left and uh, let's go ahead and do one more, one more question here, but uh, we'll go ahead and end it on this question. But uh, I would like to say uh, thanks for this presentation, Bo. It's been a pleasure. It's, I'm, I'm glad I got to meet you, and and hopefully uh, me and uh, my family will 
we'll make the journey out there eventually. I've never been to North Carolina, so hopefully uh, soon I want to head out there and maybe uh, maybe even you know meet up with you for one of these days for dinner or something. Man, it's it's it seems it seems awesome and great presentation. I appreciate. It. So the question is. Uh, have the Eastern Band citizens maintain their knowledge of their clan membership, or do only a few know their clan? Well, that is, I would say a lot of them have not, they don't know their clan. And, uh, you know, the problem is, you know, in the old days, you know, you know, they talk about the different clans and, you know, the wolf clan, they say it was large. It was one of the larger clans, but what happened? They would, they would, uh, they would, uh, cause they were warlike and they like to fight, and you know, certain families that are, <laughs> they just read to fight at drop of a hat. You said they're probably wolf clan because they they got this military, uh, ready. Let's do it. Let's fight. <laughs> you're right i know what you're talking about exactly but, but the thing was when they would have times when they would uh lose and their numbers would get low they would they would be kind of like the spartans they would come and bring people in and they would uh, adopt them and and uh but there was a lot of uh in this clan you would find a lot of different makeups of color and ideas and you know it was a a, a very blended mix and it's it's actually it was pretty good, you know. They they uh, when you do have a mixture of things and ideas, there's growth. There is growth, and you know what I would hope is that we could identify the people that still have plan. You know that we that that we could uh, identify them. And then there's I've heard people say uh, we shouldn't adopt. We shouldn't adopt. But what's happened is there's Cherokees out there that they don't have clan because their mother's not clan, but their father is. They still have Cherokee blood. They could be dark and well, you know, and not have a, a clan because their mother's not. My my children are are uh, their mother is a full blooded Blackfoot from Alberta. She's full blooded. The my children are they're more Indian than me, but they have no clan. But my stepmom, who's a different clan than you know than than I have, she she said I I want to adopt them. I want them to be with me. I will take them in. This is something that I know this is one of those things that will take will be great debate and great whatever, but as Cherokees, if we can, you know, it's not about the casino money. It's not about the perks of being uh, a Cherokee. It's, you know, if and we talked about the, the relationship. The more people that, that we bring into uh, bring into our fold and make them more Cherokee, the world would be a better place. Here's the thing. As Cherokees, we're always going to be outnumbered. We're always going to be outnumbered. You know, uh, you know the, the dominant culture is always American, whatever. But here's the thing is what we need to do as Cherokees is to Go out with the with the intent to make the world more Cherokee, to make them see who we are, what we are, what we have to offer, and to not apologize about it. And if they want to learn who we are and if they want to learn our language, the better. That's the thing. We should we should not be afraid if white people speak our language. We should be afraid if we let it die. That's that's cutting it short and simple. You know, if we have white people that are speaking, then we know that it's still being spoke. And then somewhere down the line, there's there'll be one maybe, maybe one of these white people that learn Cherokee will teach these Indian kids how to how, how to speak. It's a means to an end. So 
The reason we're here is we adapt, we change, and we overcome. As Cherokees, we need to adapt, change, and overcome. Can't live in a mindset that we were back in the 1760s. I'm dressed like this 1760s, but I have an iPhone. I'm sitting here talking to you guys using the technology. You know, we're not, we haven't sat here and ate, broke bread and ate bean bread and beans and, and laughed and had a good time. We, we've done a little bit of that, but we need to do that. We need to make it happen. And, uh, and we just need to open our, our minds and our hearts and with prayer and with, uh, with, uh, with the intention. This, this is the thing I want to leave everybody with is when you have the intention of doing something, make it happen. If you have the intention to pray, pray. Do all that you can. Don't do it halfway. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry. I apologize if I offended anybody. But I'm sorry that I broke down like a big small bag. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I appreciate everybody that was out there. With old Steve. Sounds good, Bo. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. So uh, until next time, uh, Deja Doc says, Steve. Ah, he's cool. Then I go on you, Nagada. How well? What don't?